Uh, good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the Cato Institute. Tonight we are debating the question, should libertarians vote? It is sometimes said that metaphysics begins with the question, why is there something rather than nothing? For libertarians, at least, politics begins with the question, why is there some government rather than no government? <laughs> For some of us, politics also ends there, perhaps. Uh, tonight, though, we are going to ask about a very specific act within the polity, namely voting. Taking the affirmative side and saying that, yes, libertarians should vote, we have Cato Senior Fellow Jim Harper and Michael Cannon, who is the Cato Institute's Director of Health Policy Studies. Taking the neg negative side, we have Trevor Burris on my far right, Research Fellow at the Cato Center for Constitutional Studies and Cato Research Fellow and Editor of Libertarianism.org, Aaron Ross Powell. I am Jason Kuznicki, also a Cato Research Fellow and the editor of Cato Unbound, and I will be moderating this debate tonight. Uh, some ground rules, because debates always do that. Uh, first of all, nothing that you hear here is to be interpreted as an endorsement of any particular candidate or party or ballot measure. Uh, we do not take sides on those things. That's, that's not what Cato's mission is, and so, uh, so we are going to do our best to avoid that and do not infer it because that's not what we're trying to tell you. Uh, the format will be like this. First, we'll have a 10-minute opening statement from each side, starting with the affirmative. Then there will be 20 minutes of moderator questions where I will ask questions of the panelists in alternating order. Then there will be 10 minutes of questions from the audience, and I will stress they must be questions, not speeches. And uh, following that, we will have five-minute closing statements from each side. Hopefully we won't run too far off time, uh, but we will, we will do the best we can. So without further ado, I suppose I shall turn it over to our affirmative side. Thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for participating. Thanks, all of you, for, for observing this debate. Thanks to the folks uh, watching at home. I hope it's interesting and entertaining. Um, maybe just one or the other. Uh, there's a, a lot of folks who, in the libertarian community, who argue against voting. Some of the best are, are right here with us. But I think there are three reasons, cumulative reasons, to vote. One is your direct influence on the outcome your indirect influence on, on, other, uh, on other political actors, and what, what I'll call our social influence that Michael Cannon's gonna discuss mostly. Friends of ours and good people in the libertarian community argue against voting because there's no way, almost no way, your, your vote is going to affect the outcome. Um, that's fine, again, good people, but I dare say they haven't thought this all the way through. So I wanna assess briefly the costs and benefits of voting. We'll, uh, we'll go to the back of the envelope to do some really, really excellent calculation. Um, start with cost. Does it take a thousand hours to figure out how to vote? Do you need to educate yourself about every dimension of every issue? Not really, because voting is very constrained. And if you're a libertarian, you probably already know enough about a lot of the issues. So maybe it's one to two hours, the time it takes to go. Maybe there's a line, maybe not. But if you vote by absentee ballot, you're going to knock it down quite a bit. So let's say it's 20 minutes of your time on the cost side of the equation. Uh, most models are that uh, only that you're voting in a presidential, and so that's the one that they calculate for. A very interesting study by, by uh, Gelman, Silver, and Edlin um, showing that your chance of affecting a presidential election is about one in 60 million. Depending on the state you're in, it can be higher and lower. And the next really interesting study, I think your, your, your conclusion would be, okay, one in 60 million, not worth doing, I'm out of here. But, but another study uh, by a guy named Scott Alexander assesses the value of that chance of affecting a presidential outcome at $5,000. That's based on the $2 trillion that the Bush administration expended uh, in the Iraq war, for example. What if you could have stopped that from happening? What if you had a one in 60 million chance of stopping that from happening? Maybe that's worth $50 million. Uh, the trillion plus expenditure of Obamacare, if your vote could be the one that stopped that from happening. Maybe that's worth $5,000. Still, I think that's an overestimate, so let's take it, take it down uh, by, by a factor to $500. Of course, that model of a presidential vote is not the entirety of it. 
You've got to vote in the Senate. Maybe your chance of affecting a senatorial race are one in 1.3 million. Let's throw 10 bucks uh, value at that. A House race, $1.15. Uh, your governor, maybe you can affect things such that it's worth $10 to, get a, to be the deciding vote, the chance of being a deciding vote for your governor. Your mayor or alderman, whatever the case may be. The dog catcher, maybe that's worth a buck. Um, initiative campaigns in many states are, are pretty big deals. California has a $9 billion uh, bond issue that, uh, that being the deciding vote on could be quite valuable. So you're one in 1.3 million chance and, and tweak these numbers any way you want. Let's say it's worth five bucks. So you're gonna spend a little more time, say 35 minutes on all of these. Your chance of affecting, of affecting them are small, but the value is quite high. Uh, I put 530 bucks here, but let's say it's more like 53. I think it's at least a close call. So that's direct influence. Then there's indirect influence, and I want to quote one of my favorite scholars on this question, <laughs> myself. <laughs> <laughs> Votes, and, and this, is, this comes from experience. Uh, Michael and I both worked on Capitol Hill, so we have some experience. Um, votes are a dazzling Roman candle of information supplied to elected officials, their staffs, political parties, journalists, opinion leaders, and future candidates, to name a few. Um, these witnesses are incorporating vote information, not just outcome, but win-loss margins. So they're watching those margins that you create with your vote, even if it doesn't elect or decline, de prevent the election of a candidate. And they incorporate that into their actions and assessments well beyond election and inauguration day. We're talking about people who decide to run or decide not to run. We're talking about the parties who decide to get behind candidates or not. We're talking about reporters who write differently about different candidates or parties based on all this. We're talking about opinion leaders, and of course we're talking about donors. So that's the question of indirect influence, where your vote can have some. I, I, I haven't quantified it like, the, uh, like the, uh, the, the direct influence, but there's also social influence, and I'll hand the the microphone over to Michael Cannon to continue with that topic. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Aaron and Trevor and Jason and all of you. The good news is that libertarians have defeated every threat to liberty on the planet. And the only thing left for us to discuss now is whether libertarians should vote. And if you're the sort of libertarian who does not care about making the world a better place, if you're the sort of libertarian who just wants to complain, who wants to turn people off of libertarian ideas, if you want to confirm stereotypes about libertarians being tinfoil hat wearing basement dwellers uh, who don't care about anyone but themselves, th then you should not only not vote, you should brag about how you don't vote. You should blog about how useless one vote is. You should insinuate that people who do vote are silly, ignorant, enumerate, irrational, that sort of thing. If, however, you're the sort of libertarian who wants to make the world a better place, yeah, you should vote. And Jim has talked about the, the benefits of voting in terms of uh, your influence on, uh, on um, policy outcomes or why from a strictly financial cost benefit perspective, it can be economically rational for you to vote. Yeah, the benefits of voting in terms of your influence on electoral outcomes and policy outcomes, while still not dictatorial, uh, are even greater than Jim suggests. And that's because voting has value apart from its direct effect on vote totals uh, for various candidates or referenda. And that's primarily because a lot of people see voting as an act of caring. So here's a thought experiment. Suppose an African-American mother approaches you with a campaign flyer and asks you to vote in the presidential election because she fears for her sons if Donald Trump wins and institutes stop and frisk policing nationwide. Now, a significant share of, of African Americans already believe that libertarians are full of it and really only care about preserving white privilege. Uh, if you tell her, I agree with you, but I don't vote. Now let me tell you why libertarians are your real friends. What do you think she's gonna think? Is she going, or is her mind gonna be open to your ideas after you've told her that you don't vote? Or what about a Latina who asks you to vote because she fears house to house sweep in Hispanic neighborhoods that end in the federal government uh, deporting her grandmother? If you give her the same answer, what, is she going to believe the libertarians are her friends? Um, would you believe it? If you don't vote, some people are going to think you're selfish and most people don't open their minds to what selfish people think. And that not only applies to you, it applies to every libertarian, including every libertarian who listens to you and anyone you might persuade to become a libertarian. Aaron and Trevor have thousands of obedient followers on Twitter. One more. There we go. 
thousands of obedient followers on Twitter. If they broadcast to their followers that voting is a good idea, their thousands of Twitter followers will vote, give or take. Um, if they broadcast that smart people don't vote, then their obedient Twitter followers will not. And their dis the decision, so the decision to make not voting your thing affects more than just one vote. And, and what if all libertarians made not voting their thing? What if, who have we got here? P.J. O'Rourke, Charles Murray, uh, uh, Matt yeah. Welch, Nick Gillespie, <laughs> Kennedy. Uh, we've got Gary Johnson there, John Stossel, Drew Carey. Uh, libertarians with a lot more Twitter followers than any of us have. If they decided, ah, voting is irrational and it's not gonna have an impact, and they broadcast that message to their follower, their Twitter followers, a lot of them are gonna be libertarians. We're gonna depress the libertarian vote even more. Um, and uh, and what, if, what about, what if uh, Penn Jillette did the same thing? He's got about two million Twitter followers. What if Matt Stone and Trey Parker, who a lot of people, the creators of South Park, who a lot of people suspect are libertarians, came out and said, we're libertarians. Or maybe a celebrity like Stephen Colbert decided that he was a libertarian. Should they encourage their followers not to vote? Pretty soon, you're talking about a significant number of votes not showing up in the vote tallies of general elections, not showing up in the vote tallies in primary elections, which are arguably even more important, uh, or even in the polls of likely voters, because pollsters screen for uh, whether you voted or not, or are likely to vote in the next election, and that's gonna skew how politicians, and if you don't vote, if libertarians don't vote, then their views won't show up in those public opinion surveys of likely voters, which are the most influential surveys, the ones that politicians pay the most attention to. But if they, but they could show up, our, our views could show up if libertarians play our cards right. Now, the late great economist Glenn Whitman once wrote, okay, Glenn is not actually dead. Glenn is just a, <laughs> he's a writer in Hollywood now, and he wrote this just a week ago. Glenn writes that this whole question is just a classic collective action problem. He says libertarians would all be better off if they all voted, because we'd be able to pull political parties and, uh, and policy outcomes in a more libertarian direction, yet each individual libertarian has a big incentive not to vote, because if I don't vote, I get to spend time doing other things, and you're right, it's not likely to affect the ultimate outcome. But if every libertarian follows that incentive and chooses not to vote, then we're all worse off, we don't move policy. Everyone else, that is, the people who believe in uh, liberty or equal dignity for some, but not all, uh, adapts to this problem the way humans usually do, by creating a social norm that people should do the socially beneficial thing. Libertarians would benefit from creating such, uh, and adopting such a social norm in favor of voting. This prisoner's dilemma is a repeat game. The optimal strategy is not to defect, it is to coordinate. And there are principled reasons not to vote, but some principles are bad principles. And I vote that libertarians who oppose voting re-examine theirs. Now, Jim said we should close with some shameless pandering that portrays us as sympathetic and caring people. He even offered this picture of his newborn son wearing an <laughs> I voted sticker. To do that, I have three <coughs> kids. He told me his is cuter, so we should use his. Okay. Thank you. In fairness, the other side has some adorable kids, too. <laughs> and I am going to allow them now 10 minutes to make their case. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jason. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for Jim for coming up with this event and uh, Michael for joining on and for letting me join on. So I want to start with the basics. Jim kind of went over it already. But I want your vote does not matter. I want to be very clear about this in most situations. Uh, the article he cited is still the sort of gold standard, one in 60 million chance of deciding a presidential election. Now that's a general chance. If you were in California and you're voting Republican, it can go up to one in a billion. In terms of expected value, this is a different question. Your one in a billion chance times the possibility that something's gonna get passed is how you have to actually run those numbers. Uh, Jason Brennan in his book ran the number and came up with 2.5 times 10 to the negative 2,453rd power um, for your vote to actually make a difference on expected value. Uh, of course, those are in relatively close elections. If it's a runaway victory like 1984 for Reagan or 1936 for Roosevelt, it's different. And no single vote has ever decided a presidential election. And despite Jim's argument about margins and turnout, it's the same problem. You do not meaningfully contribute to a margin. No politician has ever said, 
well, I won by 4.000017, and if I would have won by 4.0018, uh, then, I, then I would totally have a mandate. That has never happened once in human history. Uh, in a 2001 paper by Casey Mulligan and Charles Hunter that looked at 56,613 contested congressional and state elections since 1898, and the 40,000 state elections of about a billion votes, they found seven that were decided by a single vote. There was one congressional election decided by a single vote, and that was a 1910 race in Buffalo. Uh, about 41,000 votes cast, but upon recount, the single vote disappeared, which gets me to Bush v. Gore. You might be thinking that your vote, single vote matters because of Bush v. Gore. Bush v. Gore, Bush v. Gore actually proves that if a presidential election ever comes down to 500 votes, it will be decided by courts and lawyers and not by the actual voters. These facts are not reasonably up for debate. You've not mattered in every election that you've ever voted in. We could run a It's a Wonderful Life George Bailey situation and I could take you back as your angel and say, look at the world that happened in all the elections that you didn't vote in, uh, and it would be the exact same world, except for you would have more time because you didn't vote. So we should reframe the question. <coughs> Why should libertarians do an unquestionably ineffective activity, at least insofar as the outcomes are concerned? When you think about it that way, well, there's a lot of reasons to not do an ineffective activity. Actually, anything effective is a good reason not to do an ineffective activity. Rain dances are ineffective, and if someone says, why don't you rain dance, you would say, well, because it's, because it's ineffective, and that's a good enough answer. Uh, but you ask people, why don't you vote, and you say, because it's ineffective, well, that just seems weird, which is odd. You all know that your vote doesn't matter, so it's weird that probably most of you are on the other side from Aaron and I, and we're the weirdos in the room, which is also weird. So what makes this weird? Of course, what, what matters is what Michael pointed out, that. Uh, yes, your vote doesn't matter, but voting in the aggregate matters. That's a trivially true statement that we're not going to be addressing today. Voting en masse obviously matters. Uh, we're, we're reframing the question slightly to ask the, whether or not it is wrong for a libertarian to abstain from voting. And the answer to that question is no. So I want to reiterate what Trevor said. <clears throat> We are not making the case that libertarians should abstain from voting. We are not saying that it is wrong for libertarians to vote. If your vote is mathematically meaningless, we don't much care what you do with it. But instead, we reject the idea that there's something wrong with choosing not to vote, that choosing to abstain from an election is nothing to be ashamed of. We believe that there are reasonable arguments for abstaining. In fact, the argument between Jim Harper and me began when I wrote an essay laying out some of the morally troubling aspects of voting that I thought people rarely recognized. Jim responded with a blog post titled, Don't Not Vote. That's what we're pushing back on. Now, vegetarians abstain from eating meat because they believe that there are morally troubling aspects to it that cut against the benefits and tastiness and perhaps health. And they do this knowing full well that any individual's decision to not eat meat won't save the life of a single animal. Yet we don't take this as evidence that they're behaving irrationally. And what about Quakers, many of whom don't vote? What about Jehovah's Witnesses who see voting as clashing with their principles? Do we condemn them for not fulfilling their civic duty? Are their principles stronger or better than ours? Trevor and I see voting to some extent like Quakers and Jehovah's Witnesses do. Yes, your vote has no impact on the direction of the country. And yes, even still, it, like Jim says, doesn't take much time or effort. But that doesn't mean it's without costs. Voting has deep symbolic meaning in our culture, and that symbolic meaning is both overplayed and wrong-headed. Trevor and I are weird, as are many of our colleagues here at Cato, because we have a fundamentally different view of the state from most people in Washington. We believe the state's authority has moral limits and that there's a private sphere of choice it's not allowed to penetrate. Very nearly everything we vote on very nearly everything the presidential candidates have said they would do falls outside the bounds of libertarian principle. Voting is symbolically signing on to what those people will do in your name. And given that, out, that the outcome will likely be profoundly unlibertarian, that's not something I'm willing to do. Like eating meat to the vegetarian, even though I know my abstaining won't directly influence the government in a better direction, I also know that it won't make government worse. And at the same time, it allows me to maintain my principles, to live my sense of justice, which is important because I owe it to the world to make it better. 
And I can do that in part by pushing back against the histrionic and incoherent view most Americans have about the moral and causal weightiness of voting. And that makes me weird, I admit, but it's a weirdness I'm happy to embrace, and it's a weirdness that I wish more people would as well. Voting is not just a positive good, it can be positively dangerous. This might sound weird too, but it's not. People have been talking about the dangers of voting since the American founding. James Madison was terrified of voters, so he wanted filtering mechanisms and representatives. The progressives were terrified of voters, so they started creating the administrative state to insulate it from politics. All the while, our government has grown to be the most powerful organization in the history of humankind, controlling our daily lives to an almost unimaginable and unacceptable degree, and making us hate each other in the process. And why can't it do this? Well, voting, of course. The fetishization of voting buttresses the idea that voting is an adequate check on government and a justification for whatever government does. But many things we vote are beyond the legitimate power of government. We need to step back from the fetishization of voting and accurately characterize voting as a weak and inadequate form of collective choice that cannot effectively support the weight of the governments that claim legitimacy from it. The fetishization of voting can have real costs. If people raise voting to the pinnacle of civil, civic engagement, which many do, then many may ignore other types of more meaningful civic engagement. For many, when President Obama entered office, it was like a messiah. He would solve things, fix them, make it better. The anti-war movement of the left mostly disappeared, partially because of partisanship, but partially because Obama was going to take care of it. Because voting is perceived as to support the government, it can be very dangerous, as we see in every People's Republic of in the world. If the election is Hitler versus Stalin, don't vote. What if they held an election and nobody came? Those who would vote for the lesser evil whoever that would be between Hitler and Stalin, are only giving him an ability to say, however many people voted, that the people chose me and to claim legitimacy. My vote doesn't matter, and my non -vo your vote doesn't matter, my non-vote doesn't matter. It's symbolic, so let's agree that both are symbolic. You can vote for the candidate you enjoy and, do, and feel like you're doing your duty, and I don't. I symbolically non-vote. But it's important for me to stand up and remind people what's wrong with voting on the things that we do. If there was a national referendum on a national haircut and we started having a discussion about whether or not you're gonna get the hippie or the marine and people started coming out and saying, make your voice heard, put up signs in your yard, don't you believe in democracy? Someone has to stand up and say, we do not vote about these things. Loudly and without shame and honestly. And we'll be the ones who do that. Thank you. So thank you to both sides. I will now be asking each side questions. I will alternate from one side to the other. I will, however, tolerate some impromptu cross-examination and some back and forth here because I, I think that's healthy and I, I trust that my colleagues fear me sufficiently uh, to, to respect my authority. So, uh, first question, first question is to the negative side. I can imagine your argument making the opponents of libertarianism very, very happy. If you don't vote, the median voter is that much less libertarian, and the median voter always carries the election. What do you say to that? Uh, so, if I personally do not vote, uh, there is some sort of probably computer at NASA that could figure out how much the median voter actually changed because it would be a very small amount. So, because I'm talking about myself. Now, if all libertarians don't vote, so Michael's tried to con convert it um, into a question about voting mattering, uh, voting on mass mattering, which we're resisting. Our point is that it is not wrong for libertarians to not vote. And there are other ways of trying to do social change other than voting, but I actually think that changing people's minds about what, what voting can do in terms of how much it can check government is something that's socially beneficial and can change the median voter too. I would also argue that the, the question about the median voter is related to Jim's arguments about adding a giving a cost to how much our vote might benefit us or other people and that <clears throat> they assume that the candidate that we would be voting for stands some chance of winning and if that's if those arguments work then they would seem to push in the direction of being obligated as a libertarian not just to vote but to vote to, for someone say one of the major two the two major party candidates who can win 
as opposed to throwing your vote away for someone like Gary Johnson or another independent candidate who stands no chance of winning and thus your vote stands no chance of influencing things in one direction or another. Can I ask Jim a question? <laughs> uh, if, it's, if it's germane to the... Germane, what, what do you think? Is Mike's argument is that throwing your vote away is irrelevant because uh, you're about looking good. But Jim, what do you think about throwing your photo, vote away? Oh, I, well, I agree. That, that is that a good argument? Do you have to vote effectively or just vote? You should vote your conscience. Any any, any vote of conscience is not thrown away <laughs> because of the signaling because of the signaling that it that it throws out in, in so many in so many different directions. And even more than that, I mean, a vote for a third party candidate is, is not a thrown away vote. If what you're trying to do is build support for that perspective over time, and the way you do that is by having more votes in that column this year than you did last year or the year before. One way and, you do that. And, <laughs> and, and you can't just assume that other people don't exist and we're only talking about Trevor because Trevor actually influences more people than just Trevor. Trevor has some in, more than maybe he thinks. <laughs> And so we can't just assume that uh, you're making all these decisions in a vacuum and that other people don't exist. So a vote for a third party candidate is only a thrown away vote if you think the only thing that matters is whether your vote will be the deciding vote on who gets to be president uh, or who wins this election or that this year. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. This is for the affirmative side. I can also imagine your argument making the opponents of libertarianism very, very happy. Because if all libertarians voted, it is still at least conceivable that we wouldn't win. But, but the decision would be perhaps uh, said to have more of a popular mandate. After all, you voted. And this is the collective decision in which you have participated. What do you say to that? I, I think that whole, um, uh, the, the whole argument that voting symbolically legitimizes or makes uh, 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 what the government does or makes us responsible for what the government does is nonsense. Democracy is like two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for lunch. If the sheep screams, I vote no, that doesn't legitimize the process. It, it, there's nothing, I mean, you can vote for whoever you want, for, for whatever reason you want. What a vote is, it, is you are registering your opinion about how the and your influence, such as uh, a vote is, about how the government is going to use its coercive power. And if you say, I don't want it to use its coercive power, you, if you want to send that message, you can do that. And there's nothing le that, that legitimizes the state about voting for, you know, you could vote for Ayn Rand if you wanted to. You could vote for John Q. Anarchy if you wanted to. You could vote for Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> and and, it, the, and there's nothing that uh, legitimizing about that. It doesn't make you responsible for what uh, the leaders elected by all the other people do with that power that they in, achieve. In brief, I want to I want to before I get to my answer, I want to want to discuss some point of, of agreement among us. Uh, Aaron and Trevor each said that they were weird, and and that's <laughs> one point of agreement. Uh, but I do think, but I do think that the example of the national haircut was a barb thrown in the direction of the bald guys. And I understand. This is shirts for skins. If you understand what you were doing there, when the revolution uh, comes. So, so if I if I may move on. On, or, the, on the question uh, of does uh, voting ratify the outcome, I'm actually inclined to believe that there is a minor signal sent by participating in the vote. Um, and, and maybe someone somewhere on the, on the pro-big government side says, look at all the voting participation uh, that, th that there is, therefore the outcome is valid. Uh, but that is a, a minor and rarely used signal as compared to uh, the margins of victory and loss in, uh, in, in the electoral races themselves because those are used by, again, congressional staff, funders, future candidates, the signal that's given off by the the, uh, the margin of victory is much more powerful uh, in many different instances than the ratification, so-called, of, uh, of uh, the, the democratic process by the fact of participation. Can I respond but, briefly to my Yes. <clears throat> so on the sheep, it seems perfectly reasonable for the sheep to, instead of saying, I vote no, saying, you don't get to vote on this. This is not the kind of thing that we vote about. Um, also, Voting that people don't use coercive force seems like an argument for about more about ballot initiatives or similar things where should we make X illegal, yes or no, and saying 
no, we should not make it illegal, would not seem to violate libertarian principles or my libertarian principles, but it certainly doesn't seem to apply to candidates or anyone who has a reasonable chance of winning because they are, they may have some things that we think are libertarian, but they're gonna do lots of things that are not. It's not about an abdication of use of force. And thirdly, for the social signaling perspective, my sense is that people take voting unseriously. So writing in Mickey Mouse or writing in a pretend candidate or writing in Ayn Rand as Vermin Supreme. at yes. least as offensive um, and off-putting as abstaining from voting. Is it just going to the booth? Is this all that you require of me to not think I'm a weirdo? Do I, I can go to the booth and I can vote for voting? Can I leave the ballot face? blank? Um, or, or just leave the ballot, ballot blank. Is that more, is that better? Can we have a yes or no on that? And then maybe move on? Um, I'm not sure it was a yes or no. What, can you, is it okay what is the thing to just to go to the ballot box and cast a blank ballot to satisfy the requirement the, to your the, mind? The, uh, of the, I think the, the degree think of the benefits of signaling? The degree of signaling improves if you voted for one of the candidates as opposed to writing in Mickey Mouse. But if you write in a legitimate person and say, this, is, this, is, this was my choice, then you're telling the person you're talking to who you're trying to bring to your side, I too care about our community. We are together on that. Now come my way on the, the substantive issues. And, and I, I, if I can respond to a point that Aaron made, I don't think that it does, um, I, I don't think it only applies to ballot initiatives. I mean, when we're uh, voting for candidates for office, we are selecting between different people uh, and deciding who is going to get all of these pre-existing powers that exist in the apparatus of the state, in this, in this particular office. And I don't think it's uh, legitimizing or that it, uh, uh, that, it, that it validates the bad things that, 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 uh, that the, the candidate I didn't vote for did, or even the candidate that I did vote for does, if what I'm trying to do is I am trying to cast a vote for the candidate that I think is going to do the least bad stuff with all of those awful powers that I think government shouldn't have. Would you say that to Jehovah's Witnesses? I beg your pardon? Do you say that to Jehovah's Witnesses? That they should try to they vote. They should vote uh, for the least th bad. That they should vote for the least bad. Well, it depends on, uh, you know, what... Uh, I, I think that non-libertarians should not vote, so it depends on how libertarian it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going, to, I'm going to move on. I have a question, I have a question for the negative side. Quite a few people are unhappy that we are even having this debate. Uh, we have been told that we risk making ourselves look odious to the general public. Uh, your point about rain dances may be true in that rain dances are ineffective at generating rain, but anthropologists have long pointed out that rain dances serve an additional function, which is social cohesion. So in child, times so of crisis, sacrifice. in times of crisis, and periodically even without crisis, communities perform rituals to bind themselves together as a community. What do you say about the ritual function of voting? And some of those rituals are child sacrifice too, so we can actually just weigh the, ri the ritual and the morality of the ritual. I believe in, in social cohesion, but I actually think that voting uh, pulls us apart in a very specific way. I, I, politics makes us worse, as Aaron and I often say, and it makes us worse because of the things that we're voting about. Uh, it, if, you, if a Hillary supporter and a Trump supporter live next door to each other, uh, they can live next door to each other because they're not in a, in a world of property rights because they're not trying to control each other's lives. But as soon as you have them voting about what children are going to learn, evolution or creation, or whether, whether or not they're going to, uh, what kind of health care plan they're going to have, they start hating each other. And I think that the hatred that exists in America is directly proportional to the size of government and how meddlesome it is in our lives. Um, preparing for this debate, I was looking for texts about principled non-voting that were not anarchist texts. Uh, the ones I found were all Christian texts. Uh, they were all Mennonites, Jehovah's Witnesses, Quakers, writing about why they don't vote. And one of the most common ones was that it makes me hate my fellow man, and I do not follow Jesus' commandment to love thy enemy when I'm involved in a political system trying to control each other's lives. So in terms of civic engagement and how much we care about people, I think we have the better argument. Uh, actually, I think that argument uh, that you just made argues against your position. 
And here's why. What divides us is not the act of voting or the, act that we have, the fact that we have different preferences when we go into the ballot box about this haircut or that haircut or, what, or, or creationism versus evolution. It's that the government is trying to impose one answer on everybody. That's what divides us. That's what gets us, and not the act of voting itself. If the government weren't doing this, weren't uh, coming up with a one-size-fits-all rule for everybody, then I could teach creationism, you could teach evolution, we could shave our heads, and you could not. <laughs> <laughs> and we could look better than you. <laughs> and, and we would get along just fine. We would be neighbors, we would be different, but we would be civil with each other. We wouldn't have any reason to fight because to each his own. But when you say that, oh, well, the problem is voting, and voting is what divides us, and so we're, we libertarian, as libertarians are not going to vote, then you're making it even harder to get rid of those things that actually divide us. And so for all the reasons that Jim and I stated, libertarians should vote to try to reduce the, the government's influence over all of, the, all of these questions and influence Again, it does divide so you you keep, well, One quick, quick response, and I'd like to move on. You're sliding back to voting in the aggregate versus voting individually. So my individual vote will not move the government in a more libertarian direction. And secondly, from the signaling thing, our argument is that all of this weight that people have, that they place on voting, and that they think voting is how we participate, and that we ought to participate, and that if we're serious people, we ought to participate in these ways, is exactly what we're pushing back against. So we are saying that by voting and by telling people we voted and by signaling that voting is okay, we are reinforcing these false beliefs about the scope of government. And so it's not, it would be one thing if we said, I'm not gonna vote because I'm lazy and libertarians shouldn't vote because it's easier to just sit at home and play video games. That would look bad, but responding with the principled argument for why I am abstaining from this particular system seems at least arguably as persuasive in the right direction, or at least is a ray of hope that we will move in a direction where people don't think that this is a legitimate way to choose how we run our lives. Okay, I have a question now for the affirmative side. I'd like to move on. Uh, surveys have shown that less than a quarter of voters know who their senators are. They show that only half of voters know that the states get two of them. Voters often cannot name more than one candidate for the House of Representatives in their district. They can't say what the First Amendment does. Uh, they, uh, they are routinely grossly ignorant about the facts of public policy. These are embarrassing and presumably not limited to the political mainstream. How do, you, how do you recommend that anyone vote in light of pervasive voter ignorance? Like, like Michael, I think that non-libertarians should not vote. Uh, if you know enough about yourself to be a libertarian, you probably know uh, the structure of the government. You probably know that there's one representative in your district and, and two senators for your state. Uh, you probably know how you come out on most issues. So, so that, that doesn't affect our thesis, I don't think, that uh, libertarians should vote. I want to be uh, clear about what we're for, um, connecting actually all three of these questions, because what Michael had said about the intrusiveness of the government, um, it is the kind of things the government is doing uh, that we think are outside legitimate boundaries of government and that people are voting on that is the problem. That's, that's part point one. Uh, secondly, um, for the question of ignorant voters, well, we know why there are ignorant voters. Because your vote doesn't matter. Like, we have an entire system that explains why when you actually own the benefits or the costs of a decision you make, you will make better decisions. Uh, and because voting doesn't matter, that's why there's ignorant voters. Uh, it is true, though, and I think maybe Jim would endorse this, I'm not sure about Mike, but it is true that if you are very, very ignorant on the stuff that Jason talked about, it is probably your duty not to vote. Uh, and it's your duty not to vote because the point of voting is to use the, is to affect the coercive power of government. And if you do it from a position where you don't know how many representatives you have, you have no idea how many senators there are, you don't know who's running for office, who's controlling, you have no idea, then your ignorance could do a bad thing to people if you were the deciding vote. And this is, I think, a reason to advance our principled objection to voting, because one of the reasons that lots of ignorant people vote 
is because we as a culture have convinced ourselves that voting is this enormously important thing that everyone ought to do. It doesn't matter how you vote. It doesn't matter who you vote for, but just the way that you vote is the way that you discharge your civic duty. That if you get out there and you do that every four years or every two years, then you've done what you need to do as a citizen and you're done. And if we push back against that by saying, no, voting is like one of the more minor things you can do to advance your civic duty, that would seem to help cut out at least some of the ignorant voters. Uh, real, uh, real uh, very briefly, very briefly. Uh, uh, real movements uh, that, that actually rise to the level of being major parties uh, put a good deal of effort into activating their own voters and deactivating the other side's voters, uh, making, making the other side's voters feel demoralized. Right this makes an side. excellent segue into my next question, actually, which is to the negative Our, side. Might be the only movement that does that for all the other well, movements. Well, <laughs> take heart, take heart. This week, a poll was conducted, a poll was conducted of the Cato Institute's policy staff. It showed that some 70% of respondents described themselves as regular voters, and another 17.5% were occasional voters. These figures are comparable to the figures for all Americans who have a college degree or higher. I asked the negative side, why are the libertarians of the Cato Institute not taking your advice? <laughs> well, I'd start by saying that if, if we're gonna take having lots of people disagree with us as a sign that we're perhaps wrong, um, that would seem to be a big problem. <laughs> we're in the wrong the building, yes. <laughs> that, that is how voting works though, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I, my colleagues haven't listened to us enough. We don't have a problem with libertarians voting. Uh, the best reason to vote is because you feel it feels good. I mean, because it doesn't matter is part of the reason we don't really have a problem with it. Uh, but, but if you feel like you're discharging some important duty and the costs are not too prohibitive for you, you should vote. Like, I am not, we're not arguing for a principled not duty to not vote. I think we, we have in the libertarian community a, a lot of sensible people who understand these dynamics pretty well. That, that statistic you shared, Jason, suggests so. We also have some folks who uh, really enjoy signaling how much they dislike democracy. I dislike the re results that democracy produces, and my preference is for liberty over democracy. But by publicly expressing revulsion at democracy, I alienate myself from audiences that I could win to my side. So I think it's self-defeating to talk a lot if you don't vote, about not voting and why it is and, stupid And to if vote. I can build on that, I have a question that I'd like to ask Trevor and Aaron. Uh, I gave the uh, thought experiment of an African-American mother or a Latina, uh, but you could imagine any individual who faces a real threat from the outcome of an election, a real threat to their liberty that really, that really is personalized for them and, and they're very afraid of that threat. Coming to you, imagine someone like that coming to you and saying, will you vote in, for candidate X in this election. And, uh, and what would you say to that if person uh, that includes, I don't vote? Uh, that includes his statement, I don't vote. What would you say to that person that includes the statement, I don't vote, and how would that advance the cause of liberty? Let me flip that on you because as you said in your, your introductory remarks, what you're signaling is caring. And these people think that by not voting, what you're saying is, I don't care about your problem. Um, and you work in healthcare policy, and you argue that we should turn healthcare over to free markets. Lots of people, and it's one of the reasons that we have a hard time convincing people of that argument, believe that saying, turn this over to the market, as opposed to saying, I'm going to vote for a law that will help you, that will cause for someone to give you medical care is signaling not caring. So the objection is we need to convince the people that this is a poor signal of caring and that by not doing it or by turning healthcare over to markets or any of the myriad other policies that we advance the Cato Institute, we are in fact doing it out of a sense of caring. But one of these is a libertarian objective and one is not. The libertarian objective of turning healthcare over is turning healthcare over to markets. Not voting is not uh, does not reduce coercion in society. Okay. You, you, uh, wait, wait, wait. Turning wait. healthcare for, over from the government to the market reduces the influence of government in society, reduces coercion. So that is the principle that I'm trying, and the, and, and the, um, uh, the inaccurate belief that I'm trying to overcome. Me okay. 
But uh, as far as voting, it's sort of, you know, it's not something we have to take on. This, this, this belief that people have that voting is caring, even if it's false, even if it's as false as uh, the idea that government, uh, or that, 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 that markets will lead to worse health uh, to worse healthcare. Even if it's that false, it's not an argument we have to uh, take on because it is it does not involve coercion. So again, I ask you instead of instead of dodging the question, I ask you, what do you say to that voter that that who's very afraid of the outcome of an election, and how does it advance liberty? Uh, I'll tell you exactly what I say to them. Um, so, first of all, it's kind of I when people ask me about voting on initiatives and things like this because I'm and and I. I'm not, there are times I can imagine myself voting. Um, under certain circumstances where things are small, like in different, based on my cost benefit analysis, and if the government is limited. Now this is an important point because D Jim styled us as against democracy. We're not against democracy. We're against rampant, overpowering, and off the rails democracy, which is what libertarians are against too. I like what you uh, said at first, Trevor. Why don't you come on and sit over here? <laughs> so, well, but no, but if we're voting, it's a very different moral question if we're voting on a limited government. Uh, it's a different moral question for a libertarian uh, in the same way that it could be for a Quaker or someone else with different beliefs. It is if we're voting on courts and stoplights and whether or not there's gonna be a road here, uh, when we have a Venn diagram that has broad overlap, uh, that is a very different question on what we're gonna vote on. Right. Now when people ask you to vote on specific things like Mike's, I wanna get to Mike's question. Specific things on like Mike's question, first of all, I say, uh, I don't vote ignorantly. If I'm going to vote, I will research what you're talking about um, and s make a decision about whether I'm gonna vote on it. Her assertion that I have to vote or just say that I have to vote, um, I'm just gonna um, and walk away. And I didn't call this debate, right? Like, I, I don't go around telling people not, not to vote, like, usually, <laughs> um, <laughs> and making a big deal out of it. Uh, I don't do that. Um, I, if people ask me, I'll tell them, uh, or I'll just say, uh, no, I'm, I'm okay. So I, I, I don't make a big deal out of it in that, in that way. I would say that... Could, could, we, could we wrap up with this comment? Yes. Okay. Um, I would say to her, the person who is scared of their liberty being undermined by a person winning, that first, me voting for your side is not likely to impact your liberty one way or another. Second, that me living out principles of justice, living out the principles of liberty that led me to believe in libertarianism by not legitimizing what I see as largely illegitimate powers of the government has at least as much of an effect in moving the world in the right direction. And third, that I have, compared to voting, I have dedicated my career to correct to protecting this person's liberty in all sorts of ways that I think are arguably much more effective than my vote. And so if that's what matters, then I think I'm doing okay. All right, with that, I would like to uh, open the floor to questions from the audience. I see one question here. Please uh, wait for the microphone and identify yourself and make certain that your question is in the form of a question. Will do. My name is Drew Clark. I'm a columnist for the Deseret News in Salt Lake City, and I'm also working with the Gary Johnson and Bill Weld campaign for president and vice president. Um, I, I, I'm probably in the camp that, um, why are you even having this debate five days, six days before an election? Um, uh, but I am glad I came because I want to be able to ask a question of the those who are, who are not uh, uh, in favor of voting themselves personally and I just want to preface this by saying that, you know, I used to believe like you all did on this side of the table. I didn't vote the first time I was eligible to vote. And I had what I think I might regard as a, as a existential crisis, thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe I threw away that opportunity. So I've always tried to vote. I haven't always succeeded because there have been times when you're out of the country and things are too costly. So I think you two have made some good points, like we probably overemphasize the importance of voting. But by and large, I think you really have to come down on the side of voting unless you are anarchists. And I'm not sure if you are. I'm not asking you if you are. But, but what, what are you asking? The, the, reason, <laughs> the reason the question is, is uh, uh, as, a, as a form of compossible rights, uh, if I am a uh, believer that my rights need to be compatible with the rights of all other people, you act in a way such that everyone engaging in the same behavior as you would, 
if you're arguing not voting, result in a system where there was, in fact, no legitimacy to the state. So the question is, can you believe in a limited state and still abstain from voting? Or I guess I should ask it the reverse. Uh, isn't it the case that your stance only holds value if you believe that the government as a whole is illegitimate? I would push back on the idea that voting is the way that we legitimize government. In fact, I think that there are quite airtight and quite compelling arguments uh, that voting does not legitimize government. And if we're going to legitimize it, we have to do it some other way. So I would, I would question just the, the very premise of your objection. But, uh, and I agree that, as I said, our, our argument depends on what this thing that you're affecting, like a, like a flea landing on the back of an elephant, but like affecting, uh, theoretically, what it's doing. Uh, it, is, it is entirely dependent upon that, that question about whether or not I want to participate in something I view as deeply immoral. And there are things that are incredibly, the state does, a de, like the drug war, for example, locking people in cages for smoking a, dr a drug that the majority of people 80 years ago didn't like, uh, that is deeply immoral. And I don't want to sign my name to anyone who is for that even if they're for pure political purposes, even if they're really not against the drug war, but they say they're for it, well, they're still immoral, for, but for a different reason. For your position, why would you not vote for that? For voting, well, first of all, I've never met the politician who is voting, who is for all my positions. Um, so, and, I, and, and there's another noise in the system about politicians, because we've oversold, there's another noise in the system, like I said, about with the uh, expected value calculation. Uh, we need to we need to understand that. So in 2006, when the Democrats took the House and the Senate, it was all styled as a as a huge referendum on the Iraq War, and it was time for exit polls showed massive voter interest in the Iraq War. It was time for the government to rethink the Iraq War. That did not happen. Uh, candidates are they're like mirrors. They're nothing until you look at them, and they will change entirely based on when they get in office. So there's a huge amount of doubt about what they will do including someone who would be for my positions. I, I'm, not, I'm very doubtful they'd do, do anything moral, and I'm going to abstain because of that ignorance. Another question? Uh, let's see. Yes. Here. Hi. Uh, my name's Christina. I just had a question um, about the way you're addressing voting, I guess, in general. But... Um, when you're talking about it, you're talking, it seems like more of a presidential side. And when I'm listening, I feel like you guys, I'm taking it more of like a local government. I'm from a small town, Iowa of 800. So I'm just wondering when you're talking about the legitimate, I guess, like aspect of government, what would you say to people that where one or two votes do matter? Or you're talking about people, you know, school board members or city council people, where it really is going to affect your lives. And you're talking about making an impact on a smaller, more social level. That seems to be the most important, what you, you know, in your community, your kids are learning and different things from everything from their local economy or whatever. But, and then, yeah, I guess that's my only question. I won't go on anymore. But. So the position Trevor and I are staking out is that there are multiple considerations in play. And so one of them is how likely your vote is to influence things, to decide the election, to move margins in a way that's going to change things. And then there are the moral considerations and that you need to weigh them against each other. And so the smaller the election is, the fewer people who vote, the more chance there is that your vote will matter. And so it may be that you flip to a point where that outweighs our moral concerns. But also there's this weird thing that happens in this country when we talk about elections, which is the indignation that we express for people who say that they're not going to vote only really comes up when we're talking about the presidential elections. Lots and lots of us, far fewer of us vote in those small elections as a percentage than vote in the national elections. Um, we don't get mad when people say, I didn't vote in the midterm or I didn't vote in the school board election, even though they have a greater chance of affecting things in those. So we're in this weird situation where rhetorically the the rage that people feel at non-voters is inversely proportional to how much the vote matters. Yeah. Let, let me endorse the question because uh, a lot of people come to this based on a model, and that's the model that you're going you're gonna to have one vote in the presidential election and that's the only thing going on. Down ballot gives you lots and lots of opportunity 
to affect things. You're more likely to, to affect outcomes by all, it's all in, on small margins. Uh, but participating in these elections is, uh, is, is, a, is a big deal in the small town. Uh, I'm, I'm, I just, uh, this is a, a, a tangentially related story. My mother used to rant against, uh, against a variety of things, um, but, in the, but in the political sphere, uh, she turned that ranting into action. It, didn't, it wasn't a vote, per se, but she ran for office. She ran for a hospital board in San Mateo County, California, that purported to govern a hospital that no longer existed on the platform that she would do away with the board. Listen, she wasn't going to get elected, and she didn't, but she said something to a lot of people. And she maybe hooked up with some minds who thought again about whether the San Mateo County Hospital Board should exist. So it's the down, the, think about the down ballot, not just the pure economic model that we're all only talking about I, the presidential. I, 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 I see there, I've seen a lot of questions in the audience, and I have promised both sides a closing statement, although if you want to waive that in favor of more questions, I'd, I'd be okay with that too. What do you? I've got a killer close. So. Okay, well. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take one more question, I guess, and then close. Yes. You, in the front, yes. My name is Sage Leeson. I would like to ask something in regard to not voting because of ignorance. So what I'm wondering is, why would you promote not voting instead of promoting being informed, educating yourself, and being an ongoing learner? How is that better? Um, being educated on all of the issues, uh, so not just the presidential election, but the down ballot stuff that Jim is big on, is extraordinarily time consuming. It has a lot of opportunity costs. I mean, there are plenty of issues that I don't have enough knowledge on to say that I could vote in an informed way, one way or the other, and I spend 40 hours a week doing this stuff. So I think that the, there, the cost, the problem with saying to the ignorant voter, become informed is that it means giving up a lot of things in their lives that they could be doing otherwise that are probably important to them and are probably more important to them than the effect of their single vote. And the ignorant voter qu uh, question relates to the local government question. Uh, there are concerns I have in local government that I might vote, but I don't know enough about it to vote. And I have other things to do with my time. That are that I consider virtuous and okay. I mean, I mean, if I, Aaron's taking care of his kids, he's going to take them to school. Like these things, if it's like, well, I could learn everything about this ballot initiative, or I could take my daughter to piano practice. I mean, that, those are the kind of trade offs that matter. Um, so, and people make those trade offs in different ways, which is why they're ignorant voters. All right, I think we should move to closing statements. Jim, you have promised a killer close, so deliver. Uh, oops, I played the expectations game wrongly. <laughs> um, listen, I, er, 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 around the middle of this thing, I said that I do not like the results of democracy. And when I say that, I'm talking about the war on drugs, and particularly its impact on minority communities, uh, the war making that is a constant feature of United States policy, uh, mass surveillance, the list goes on and on and on. Um, but that isn't a reason not to vote. It doesn't create moral arguments against voting. I think you've got to live in the world. Uh, persuasion is the name of the game. When I worked on Capitol Hill, some professors came in, we're doing, uh, I was doing tech policy, some professors came in and they said, in 20 years, the whole thing is gonna be regulation of bits. Forget about cable, forget about telephone, forget about satellite, it's all just gonna be bits. And my colleague and I, we sat and la looked at him and kind of laughed to ourselves. Well, you've just solved 5% of the problem. That's figuring out what the right answer is. The other 95% of the problem is getting people to come along with you, getting a bill passed in Congress in this case. But we, we know a lot of the answers, we think, in the libertarian community. The other 95% of the problem is getting people to come along with us. Let me also say that the people who have the power now and the people who use this power of democracy in ways that we don't like, they have that power because they've solved the collective action problem. On Facebook, on TV, individually, they're all saying, get out and vote. Get out and vote. They're not doing these precise 
uh, calculations about whether it's rational or efficient. They're all voting. And they're going to turn around next year and start telling us something they want to do in another realm that I'm not going to like. So join me in solving this collective action problem. Join me in voting for the candidate of your choice. That was a killer close. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got about a, uh, a little bit left in our closing statement, so I, I just want to answer two questions. The first one is, is voting wrong? And I think the answer there is no. I think voting badly is wrong, but voting itself is not wrong. Um, is not voting wrong? Well, I don't think it's so wrong that we should be um, uh, th that we should be publicly shaming people if they choose not to vote, especially if they are likely to vote badly. Um, but if if you're a libertarian who wants to influence people, if you want to influence policy outcomes, then yeah, I think uh, not voting is wrong because you are reducing your influence. You're reducing your ability to uh, affect policy outcomes. And I think Aaron's answer to my hypothetical question about that, that, that woman who hands him the flyer and says, will you vote for me, uh, illustrates why. Because that was a cogent answer. I think it will, I think it's actually correct that you are devoting your career to trying to expand human liberty. Um, but I think she moved on to the next three voters in the time you Get you, you took to, to, to give that answer, uh, whereas a simple, yeah, I vote, um, and I care about what you care about would have gotten you a lot farther. Uh, well, so been, uh, we're going to yeah. ask you now to deliver your closing statement, and then after that we will close. This, is, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I, I want to point out a few closing ideas. First, Mike's entire argument is only an argument for lying about voting. Um, and not voting. So you can combine both of us together and you just lie and said you did. Uh, second, <laughs> Jim Harper's argument about being a rational calculator, uh, I asked them how many times in the last 10 years they've written their congressman, gone to a local school board meeting, uh, uh, voted in a primary, voted in a local election, all of these things that can matter on Jim's calculus. Writing your congressman matters a lot. And I don't understand, I mean, if we're having this debate about what, what effectiveness is, should be saying, well, why didn't you do that, Jim, if he hasn't? Maybe he does all the time. But one reason you wouldn't do it is because you rationally calculated it wasn't worth the cost, and then this whole voting thing comes up, and we spend this whole debate on this. We should be talking about other things. Again, we're not talking about voting in mass. Uh, all, they keep sliding over into this fact that voting matters. That's so trivially true that it would be crazy for us to come up here and say it doesn't. Uh, your vote doesn't matter, and if it goes against your conscience, you don't have to vote. So that's what this debate was at. It's not wrong for a libertarian to abstain from voting. It's also okay for libertarians to vote. Don't, don't vote, do vote, it makes no difference to us, but if you vote, vote with your wits about you and vote for something or someone that doesn't compromise what you stand for. Who cares if it won't matter? It matters deeply to you and it should. And if you want to have principles that matter, and if you don't vote, don't sweat it, take your kid to the park, write your congressman, stick it to the man and become an Uber driver, circumvent the state. You don't have to pre we don't have to preach the gospel of non-voting, but having a mature conversation about the virtues and vices, the powers and limitations of voting has always been official, and in many ways it's long overdue. Principles are a very difficult thing to have in the world of politics. In many ways, politics is the art of the possible, is the art of compromise, which means that a principled politician is usually an unemployed one. If you're a libertarian, please don't forget what you stand for, and that's liberty. Democracy or voting is not the same thing as liberty. Yes, democracies look like they promote liberty more than some of the alternatives, but they can also easily go astray. And when they do, those in government usually cite the people as justification. Maybe by consciously not voting, by being able to explain to others why we're not voting, we can change not just the policies of our existing government, but people's beliefs about government. We can say that there are better, more meaningful ways to achieve prosperity and peace and justice. We don't need to resort to the state every time we see a problem, and we can convince them that the state is very often the wrong way to solve those problems. In a sense, the problem with voting as practiced today is that people take it too seriously as a means for achieving good governance. They invest it with too much meaning. 
when abstaining doesn't make things worse and voting doesn't make things better, by making the principled choice not to participate in a false show of public spiritedness, we can take some of the air out of big government's, out of big government's balloon. Just because everyone is praising the emperor's clothes doesn't mean that you have to. Thank you. Thank you. So I am, I am not unaware of the irony of asking who won this debate and asking you all to vote on that question. <laughs> However, uh, if, I, if I might have a show of hands won, first abstain. for the affirmative. <laughs> for the affirmative. And for the negative, I think I'm going to call it for the affirmative. And, and I, how, many changed their how, how many here changed their minds? Hey. Well, OK. And, and which direction did you change your mind toward? <laughs> I, I saw Actually, one hand go this behind. way, one hand go that way, and one hand not move. So. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, may maybe you won more than you realized. Uh, in any event, in any event, we can uh, continue to discuss this at the reception, which I believe is one floor down in the lobby. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great, great. Thank you all for attending.